Uh, hello everyone, thank you for joining us tonight for our next KISS lecture uh, on the stimulating culture of innovation at the Aerospace Corporation. I'm happy to introduce our speaker tonight, Rob Sherwood, uh, who is the Deputy Executive Director of Innovation at the Aerospace Corporation. I had to make sure I get that whole title right too. Um, Rob completed his Bachelor's in Aerospace Engineering at CU Boulder, his Master's in Mechanical Engineering at UCLA, and he did his MBA at Loyola Marymount. Um, Rob has held a wide range of roles in industry over his career. He spent 19 years at JPL uh, doing everything from engineering to project management um, to being a program executive, uh, and he just worked on a whole range of really cool missions there. Um, after his time at JPL, he was the executive program manager uh, for the Moon Express at NASA Ames, uh, which was, um, they put together a uh, concept for a private lunar lander, uh, or lunar mission, I should say, for the Google X Lunar Prize, um, or Lunar X Prize. After that, Rob deviated from the aerospace industry for a bit. He uh, worked at DreamWorks Animation, and that was just before taking on his current role at the Aerospace Corporation. Um, so, in summary, uh, Rob has done basically everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and my understanding is that even includes, he plays guitar and co-leads uh, in his band called the Big Band Theory uh, with a bunch of other folks from JPL and DreamWorks. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome Rob up and hope you all enjoy his talk. Thanks, Mike, for the kind introduction. I'm not sure about everything, but <laughs> um, it's an honor to, to speak here at Caltech. I'm going to talk today give you a little bit of background on the Aerospace Corporation, because not a lot of people know exactly what we do and, and what we're about. Then I'm going to talk about our innovation program, and then I'm going to give you some examples of innovation that we've created at the Aerospace Corporation. But first, I want to start with some motivation for our innovation program. The, the Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Heather Wilson, spoke at the National Space Symposium last week in Colorado Springs. And I thought I'd share a few of her remarks that exemplify our need for increased innovation in the national security space domain. About three weeks ago, the 11th Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado detected and warned of a missile launch from Abdul Kalam Island off the southern coast of India. It flew for three minutes before making impact with an Indian satellite about 300 kilometers above the Earth. Is three minutes from launch to detection to impact. The Combined Space Operations Center at Vandenberg Air Force Base immediately began tracking and cataloging about 270 pieces of debris that are each bigger than 10 centimeters, which is what they can track with radar from the ground. Now, India's space program started in the early 1960s, but last month they became the fourth nation to demonstrate anti-satellite capabilities. The shift we're seeing in national security space over the past two years is driven by a clear-eyed assessment of the world as it is. China is deploying satellite jammers, operationally based anti-satellite weapons, and directed energy weapons. Russia is developing ground launch missiles, directed energy weapons, and sophisticated satellites that interfere with our satellites on orbit. Why are they doing this? because America is the best in space and our adversaries know it. To remain dominant in space, we recognize the need to change our strategies and our programs supporting these strategies, and that's where innovation comes into play. So these are exciting times in the space business. These are, we're seeing a lot of historic changes all across the space enterprise. Space has become a, a common domain for the human endeavor. The cost of launch has plummeted. The size of payloads has declined. The technical advances that we've seen in the last few years have made space much more accessible and more useful to more countries than ever before. There's 66 countries now that have, it's probably more than that, this probably changes every few months, that have some kind of asset in space, either a satellite or an instrument. That, that's a huge change just in the last decade. And as we know, space impacts our life in, in many ways. Obviously, GPS for getting from point A to point B or sending that Amazon driver to drop the package off at your house. 
Um, the timing signals on, on the GPS satellites are used by the financial industry that really underpin all the financial transactions. Weather and environmental monitoring, agriculture, search and rescue, communications, and of course national security, everything from missile warning systems to intelligence gathering. And recently NASA's opened an a ambitious new chapter in lunar and planetary exploration. They just announced within uh, the last week or so that they're moving the landing to the moon up from 2028 down to 2024. So that's in the next five years. So this is, uh, this is also from last week. This is SpaceX, this, their second flight of the Falcon Heavy rocket. And they managed to land all three boosters from that rocket. So now they can reuse those boosters with the exception of the, the one that landed on the sea platform, which you'll see here in the video in a second. If you look at this platform and look at how much it's moving, there, there's 10 foot seas and they still managed to land this booster on that platform. Unfortunately, when they were bringing the drone back to, to shore, the, the rocket fell over. The, <laughs> the, the seas were too rough to tie it down to have people out there. So they, they weren't able to tie it down. They're, they're working on a robotic uh, way to tie that down. But they also recovered the, the payload fairing, which is the top of the rocket. So that's most of the rocket they're able to recover and reuse. This is a very expensive $60, $70 million asset that now they can refurbish, refurbish and reuse, bringing the cost of launch way down. Well, what does that do? That opens up whole new markets, whole new business ideas for how you can use space and what you can put up there if, if the cost of launch comes down that much. So let's talk a little bit about the Aerospace Corporation. We are the trusted technical advisor to government on complex space enterprise programs. We're, we're also an FFRDC, which is a federally funded research and development center, and we're the only one that's dedicated to the entire space enterprise. We work closely with the DOD space, the Air Force, the National Reconnaissance Office, some other government organizations. We work with NASA and NOAA on the civil side. We also work with commercial companies. Uh, FFRDCs, if you're not familiar, they're basically sponsored, there's a government agency sponsor, um, which is usually the DOD or NASA or the D Department of Energy. Um, they perform work that can't be done by any other entity, and they're, they're, they're there to be that sort of neutral third party. They, they are administered independently to ensure objectivity, and they work in the national interest. Now, aerospace specifically, we evaluate technologies for advancement of space systems and we serve as the nation's corporate memory for space programs. And we try and keep America at the forefront of space development using our cutting edge tools for analysis and our facilities and labs to deliver solutions to complex technical problems. We have about 4,000 employees. There are about three quarters of our technical staff, about 800 PhDs. Uh, most of the rest of the technical staff are masters. And we are located primarily in California, in El Segundo, and here in Pasadena, and also out in the, in the uh, DC area. We have a few offices out there. But anywhere where there's a NASA center or an Air Force base, we have personnel on site and usually have an office there. So aerospace has been around for about 60 years, and we've always been a very innovative company. In fact, in 1966, we developed the study that recommended the architecture for a global satellite navigation system, which we now know as GPS. And the architecture that we recommended in our report is what is being used on GPS. So why would a company that has been innovative for so long, why are we talking about innovation at the aerospace company? That should just go without saying. And the reason why is because the world is changing and that change is accelerating. In the past decade, we've seen hundreds of aerospace startups that are changing the way that we use and access space. New launch companies such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Orbit, and Rocket Lab are bringing down the cost to access space with their, with their new rocket systems. Other startups are building CubeSats and other small satellites with constellations in the hundreds bringing down the cost of, of developing satellites and changing the business models. For example, the company Planet, they've launched over 200 satellites. They can image any point on Earth at least once a day, and in many cases, multiple times a day. And they're, they, were, they were funded by VCs. They're not funded by the government like traditional aerospace. And they're, they're changing the model. They're selling their data to commercial companies. 
companies that are looking at commodities, they're selling the data to, to Walmart, counting cars in their parking lots. It's a whole new model for space. A recent Space News article mentioned that there's over 900 new space-related startups that are planning to launch over 18,000 satellites in the next five years. That compares with about 2,000 satellites that are in orbit right now. Now, the same industry trends of lower cost access to space, lower cost using commercial technology, those are also available to our adversaries, including smaller countries like Iran and North Korea. So that since they have access to those same inexpensive technologies, they can also innovate very quickly to create systems that can threaten our space systems and also to reduce our asymmetrical advantage in space. So we're trying to innovate at the same speed that our adversaries are innovating at. So that's, that's why we're focused on innovation. So Aerospace started the Innovation Lab in January of 2017, a couple years ago. And this is a corporate strategic initiative directly from our new CEO who came from Virgin Galactic. And this is to renew our employees' focus on innovation. The charter for iLab is to foster an innovation ecosystem, energize our innovation culture, and accelerate the transfer of new technologies to our US government customers. In a sense, we're trying to bring the spirit of a startup to a very well-established aerospace organization. And we're also trying to get all the employees at aerospace involved in innovation. So the, the iLab initiative has, has three components to its strategy. The first is energize our culture. And this is really, this is about our people. All those innovative ideas come from our staff. And we're trying to make it easy for them to take those ideas um, to, to, we have a set up a bunch of programs for them to work through those ideas, to brainstorm, and to get those ideas funded to help solve problems for our customers. The second part is foster our ecosystem. And that's really about how do we deploy our resources. There's three components to that. The first is the hubs. Th these are communities of interest around 10 different technical areas that we've deemed strategically important at aerospace. And each of these hubs, the idea behind the hubs is they look internally, what are we doing in that technical area? What's happening on the outside? What's happening in commercial industry? What's happening at the other government labs? And where do we want to go? Where do we want to be several years down the line? How can we meet our customer hard problems in the future? So they, they, look, at, they look for gaps and where we are now and where we want to be, and they help us develop an investment strategy. So that rolls into our internal research and development funding, or, or TechVest. And then the last component is ventures. These are the really high risk ideas that may have a really high payoff. They may change the way that we do a, a particular part of our space enterprise. So those are things that might not normally get funded in the traditional internal research and development programs. And then the last piece is, how do we go from ideas to a solution in the customer's hands? So that's our innovation life cycle. Taking ideas, turning into concepts, doing some discovery, prototyping, user testing, and then handing it over to the customer. So here are some of the programs that we have for our, our employees to help them move innovation forward. The first one is the Lunchbox. This is kind of a, a fun program. This is the Lunchbox right here. Looks like a Lunchbox. <laughs> so th these are boxes that, these are kits that the employees can check out. This is our first iteration of it. It has an Adreno circuit board. There's a bunch of sensors, connectors, a power system. It's a very easy way to get involved in electronics. If you're not an electronics engineer, you can check one of these out. It's really easy to, to build something that can control something else. And now you'll have some exposure to electronics. One of our employees took one of these, these lunch boxes and built a kit for the solar eclipse that was in August of 2017 to control his camera and his telescope. So he was able to sit back and watch that, that full two minutes of solar eclipse without having to play around with his camera. And he came up with this picture right here, or this sequence of pictures, using, using this kit controlling his camera, which is pretty incredible. Our second iteration of the lunchbox is going to have three small programmable robots. So for, for folks that wanted to get into a little bit more autonomy and, and understanding how to, to program robotic vehicles, it's a good way for them to get introduced to that. 
Sabbatical, that's a very um, popular program. This is, if you have an idea and you want to really spend some time and, and dive deep into that idea, but you have your full-time job, so it's kind of hard to do that, you can take a week off from your job. Either you or a small group of employees, maybe three to five employees, can, can come over to our innovation space for an entire week and really just dive deep on some problem and try and figure out a solution to that. Prototyping. We have a maker space that we just opened last week. We call it Sandbox. If, if you have an idea and you want to build a physical prototype, now you can come to our maker space, use some of our 3D printers or other equipment to create a physical model. Now hack sessions, these, these are more guided. This, the, the iLab staff are more involved in this. So this, the idea behind a hack session is really just a brainstorming session, but you start with a very specific question. Oh, an example hack session that we had a few months ago is, if, what's, a, what's another way to do missile warning? Right now we use satellites with IR sensors that are orbiting the Earth, um, but the Air Force is very worried because there's, there's six of those Sibir satellites, and we now know there's four countries. We don't have to worry about one of those because it's us. There's three other countries <laughs> that can destroy a satellite, six missiles, and you now no longer have a missile warning capability. The last six detections are going to be the detections before you no longer can detect anything. So they want a more resilient way to detect missiles. So that was the hack session. What's, what are other ways we can detect missiles? So we had a hack session on that, came up with a whole bunch of ideas on that. And then out of a hack session, you pick some of those ideas, some of the ones that look most promising, try and pick at least one crazy one, and then you form a scrimmage. So a scrimmage is separate teams that are diving deep on that solution to try and flesh it out a little bit more to see if it's something that's really going to work or not. So in, in this case, we had, in this particular hack session, we had four different teams that looked at four different solutions. They went off, they studied that for a couple of months, and then they came back and they presented their solutions to each other, and then we pull the best pieces of each, each of those solutions, and then we can form a project and we can fund that with our internal research and development funds or our venture funds. And then the last part is challenges. We have internal competitions, but we also participate in external competitions. Uh, for example, the Army had a signal challenge competition about six months ago. It was a blind signal competition. So they were broadcasting some signal. You didn't know what the frequency was. You didn't know what information is in there. The idea was, tell me as much as you can about this signal. And so we, we actually had the only way to, to solve this, you can't use brute force. We use a software-defined radio, a broadband scan, to figure out what the, where the signal is, and then figure out what the information is in it. We had to use AI in order to do this using a deep learning algorithm. And we actually won this. There was 80 teams, other universities, other FFRDC, some commercial companies, and we won the challenge for that, which is the first time we've done one of these external challenges. We're an FFRDC. It was a $100,000 prize. Nobody knew what to do, if we could accept that. <laughs> it, took, it took our legal people a little while, but they finally figured that one out. So another area we're focused on is partnering with all of these innovative startups. Uh, we, we can't invent everything internally, so it's really good to go out and talk to these and partner with these companies, because they're doing a lot of innovation on the outside. So we reach up. We reach out to the startups through many different channels. One is we partner with Starburst. They're an aerospace accelerator that's based down in El Segundo as well. And the idea behind Starburst is they partner with a lot of different startup companies that are aerospace related or adjacent technologies that could be used in the aerospace industry. And they hold events where they have a pitch event. 10 startups come in, they pitch their idea, and in the audience, there's usually commercial companies, all the, all the prime aerospace contractors. Aerospace is usually there. Usually there's JPL there, other FFRDCs, universities, to hear about what, what ideas are out there and what kind of solutions do you see. And they actually vote on the different companies, and they score them at the events. We've hosted several of these events at Aerospace and had our government customers in the audience getting them exposed to some of the new innovation that they then can say, hey, this is something that I think we, we see a solution here. You should partner with these, with these folks. JPL has also hosted several of these events, but that's been really successful. We're actually holding an event next month that's focused on the intersection of AI and robotics with Starburst at Aerospace. 
We also formed the Space Ventures Coalition. Um, this is with JPL, DARPA, um, RAND, Army Research Lab, and several local universities. And the idea here is to pool our resources in identifying and accelerating startups to help solve our related problems. So each of the institutions recognize that we should be working with these startups. They're doing a lot of innovation. And they're all, they were all doing, we were doing it, JPL was doing it, all these other organizations. They're all doing their research, trying to figure out what startups are out there, who can help us. We figured it would be better if we all came together and pooled our resources. So now we're working towards a common need. And I think we can do a lot more if we're working together. I mentioned we have a makerspace. This just opened last week, so this is just a few pictures of our makerspace. Um, we got some 3D printers, a soldering station, um, some other tools and equipment to build things up. We actually have more equipment than we can fit in here, so we're trying to find more space for this. This is in our innovation center. Uh, benchmarking. We, uh, I led a benchmarking study last year where I met with the CTOs or the innovation staff at other, other FFRDCs, other university affiliated research centers, and some commercial companies to talk to them about how do they do innovation? How do they fund their R&D? What are some of the best practices that we can learn from those organizations to bring back and, and use at the Aerospace Corporation? Um, there's, there's, there's several several of these items that we've implemented using collaboration spaces, um, doing hackathons. We've had hackathons. We just built our makerspace. There's a lot that we learned from them. So now I'm going to talk about some of the examples of innovation that have come from our innovation program. So aerospace for, for many, many years has built small satellites. Um, probably most of you are familiar with CubeSats. They're satellites that are a, it's basically a four inch cube or multiples of four inch cubes. Each one of those is, is called a unit. Um, this here, right here, this is a one half unit satellite. Um, this is our AeroCube 6. This is actually one that's flown. We've flown over, built and flown over 30 satellites. We build satellites for JPL, um, and we actually there's actually one launching today, ironically, same day I'm giving the talk. <laughs> um, and hold on, I got to pop up here. Uh, so there's six aero cubes that are slated for launch this year, and we're currently operating 19 satellites. Here is a video taken from one of our aero cube satellites. This was the August 2017 solar eclipse. That's the shadow as it's passing over the Earth taken from our CubeSat. Here is some imagery from another one of our CubeSats. This is the AC7 CubeSat. This is a three imaging payload. It has visible shortwave infrared and longwave infrared. These are a few images of the campfire in Chico, California from last November. Generally, we build CubeSats to prototype new technologies. We don't really do operational missions with our CubeSats. But this, now that we've shown that this is something that can work and work really well, you could put up a fleet of these CubeSats that could monitor fires anywhere in the world. And not just fires, it can also be used with this particular imaging payload. You can use that for cloud cover detection, surface temperature measurement. You can monitor volcanoes, um, gas flares, and detect nighttime lights. Now here you're seeing from one of our CubeSats, that's actually lightning in Texas from a couple months ago. The, this data was actually reduced to about 1 25th of the resolution in order to get this video down. Otherwise, it takes forever to get down. But we're working on that as well. <laughs> so here's, here's some examples of prototypes. Um, in, in 2018, we launched AeroCube 7B and 7C which is the OCSD, or Optical Communications and Sensor Demonstration Mission. So this is a demonstration of using laser communications from a CubeSat. We're, we're trying to solve that issue of getting data down faster so we can send those videos down in full resolution. This particular CubeSat required a 0 0.025 degree pointing using a new water-based propulsion system in order to demonstrate this laser com capability. 
So we were able to communicate at 200 megabits per second, which is about 100 times greater than previous CubeSats. And that was only limited by the, the modem that we had on the ground. It wasn't actually limited by the, the communication system on the satellite. And this was something that NASA Science Mission Technology Directorate funded. And then Rogue One, this is one that hasn't launched yet. So this is an example of we were challenged by the Air Force to reconstitute a missile warning capability within a month. And we came up with this concept for a pro proliferated LEO constellation of 3U satellites. 3U is, is about the size of a loaf of bread that have an innovative sensor suite that I can't really talk about today. We're going to fly this prototype later this year. And then lastly, the NIRAC. This is a space station instrument that's going to be launching in a couple of months. And it's an air glow sensor. So it takes nighttime imagery and it studies lower atmospheric processes that affect space weather. Airglow is a, it's a natural process. It's similar to the aurora that we see at higher latitudes. NIRAC studies the infrared portion of the airglow spectrum, and it has a camera that's able to capture images of the ground and clouds at night when there's no other light. It actually uses the airglow as a light source. So just two weeks ago, two NASA-funded CubeSats teamed up on an impromptu laser comm demonstration. So in this video, you'll see, you'll see a flash right there. So that's one CubeSat right there pointing its laser comm payload at another CubeSat that has a sensor that's basically just imaging that. It didn't have a laser comm receiver, but we we're just trying to prove that we could point two CubeSats at each other from 1,500 miles away and with accurate enough pointing that we would be able to communicate with laser communications with two CubeSats if we had the receiver on the other end. We're planning to demonstrate that later this year with another CubeSat that has a laser comm receiver. How bright. Is that How bright. Um, I'm not sure what the power is, but it can't be that much because it, it's a one and a half U CubeSat. So it's basically three times the size of this little box was, so it's, I'm not sure how many watts, but I, I'm guessing it's five watts or less, yeah. So drones, as we all know, are, are everywhere now. They're becoming less expensive. They're easier to fly. They're carrying heavier payloads. Um, we've seen that drones can carry weapons. Oh, um, there was an incident in South America uh, last year where we've seen that. So that's sort of increased the potential for for nefarious use by hostile actors. So we're also involved in drone technologies. Specifically, we're looking at counter drone. How can we defeat drones that get into an area that may cause a lot of damage? So we, we have a lot of expertise in modeling and simulation. And using that, we're able to select optimal sensor locations and line of sight to figure out where potential threats might be. And this is a system we've tested at the LA Coliseum, at the Super Bowl the Rose Bowl, and some other large events. So aerospace has also been involved in creating a new architecture for procuring national security space systems. So currently, space systems from development through operations can take 20 years or more. The, the GPS system, for example, I believe the most recent iteration of that, GPS-2, was uh, 23 years from when it first started being developed till the planned end of operations. The problem with having such a long lifespan is it's really hard to get new technologies and new innovations into those programs. We also buy the space system, the instruments that are on the, the space system, and the ground system as a single package. It can be a very expensive solution. You end up, we have all these different space systems. And they're all using different ground systems. So you have to have different personnel controlling the different systems. So we propose a new architecture called Continuous Production Agility, or CPA for short. And the idea behind that is having shorter development times, three to five years to orbit, shorter operational lifetimes, and a flexible architecture with common interfaces and a common bus between different programs and also a common ground system between different programs. So this is going to allow for easier insertion of new innovation from commercial companies into these systems. 
and it also opens the door for constellations of small satellites in low Earth orbit rather than using a few large satellites in medium Earth orbit or geostationary Earth orbit, which can be seen as easy targets for our adversaries. We're very interested and um, have been tasked with dealing with the problem of space debris, which is becoming more and more of a problem. In fact, that Indian satellite last week added several more hundred pieces of space debris. So this is a simulation here. I'm not sure if you can see over here, but this is counting up the years, showing how many pieces of space debris are orbiting the Earth. And these are pieces that are at least 10 centimeters or larger, which is what we can easily track with ground-based radar. There's a couple step events. Those are some of the anti-satellite tests that you see on there. When you get up to modern day, we're up to close to 20,000 pieces of space debris. And the problem with space debris is if one of those pieces hits one of our satellites, it's game over for that satellite, more than likely. Even a much smaller piece that we can't track, which we start to get into the hundreds of thousands or millions of pieces of debris when you get down to a centimeter. If it's heading at the, if it hits the satellite in the right point, it's, that, that's it for the satellite. So we're, we're looking at different technologies for tracking debris and also for capturing debris. One of those is called BrainCraft. This is a project that was funded by the NASA NIAC program. And this is a proposed flat membrane, three by three spacecraft. It's less than half the thickness of a human hair. It's very light, it's very maneuverable, it's fuel efficient. And the idea behind BrainCraft is it can wrap itself around a piece of space debris and then deorbit that to burn up through the atmosphere. So you can envision launching a stack of a couple hundred of these and they could fan out and maneuver themselves over to some of the debris that's in a particularly bad orbit. Maybe it's a chance of collision with one of our satellites or the space station and then bring those pieces down. So space debris, it threatens our, our satellites on a daily basis. We track them. Sometimes we have to do orbital maneuvers in order to get out of the way of space debris. We have these ground-based radar systems. But if you, if you heard me before, I said in the next five years, there's going to be another 18,000 uh, 18, small satellites that are going to be launched. That's too, that's too many to be tracking with ground-based radar. So we need a better way to track the satellites in orbit as well as debris. So we came up with a concept called Blinker. This is a, it's similar to what we use in the aviation industry. It's a small box. It's about the size of a deck of cards. It's got a solar cell on one side. You can attach this on the outside of your satellite and it basically broadcasts your position at regular intervals and a code so you know which satellite you're on. So those, those can be easily tracked on the ground. It's much more accurate than using radar. You can also put these on a, a rocket body. So instead of having a spent rocket body that's orbiting the Earth as a piece of debris, you, you'll know where it is at all times. So this is, this is one solution for making sure you know where everything is up in orbit. Hive. This is an interesting concept for a new mission. So this is a modular spacecraft that can interconnect with other modules. It looks something like this. It has some interesting attributes. It's got a gimbal on the inside, so you can actually change the instrument without having to maneuver the spacecraft. And that's important because they can interconnect with each other to form larger apertures. This is, this is actually high version one. We're working on high version two now, which is actually a ring architecture with concentric rings, which has some particular advantages. One of the nice things about Hive is if it gets hit by a piece of orbital debris, you can actually just eject the modules that were damaged and then reform your collective and continue your mission. Although you just created more orbital debris. <laughs> <laughs> so Sextant, uh, this is an interesting technology. GPS, we're, we're responsible for the GPS system for the Air Force, but GPS can be fooled, and aerospace is looking at innovative solutions for determining the position of vehicles if the GPS is jammed. You can actually buy a commercial GPS jammer online for a couple hundred dollars. 
but we're, we're looking for ways of making the, the GPS receivers jam-proof or spoof-proof. You can actually spoof a signal also. That's been demonstrated where you can broadcast a different signal. And there's been tests done where a boat has been driven off course. You can slowly deviate. And actually, they think they're going one place, but they're really driving somewhere else. So we tested a system called Sextant. This uses a commercial software-defined radio with a broadband receiver. And what it does is it maps all the background signals. So everywhere you are, of course, there's radio signals, there's TV signals, there's signals coming from radio stations, there's Wi-Fi signals, cell phone signals. What we did is we came up with this receiver and it, we, we drove all the way around El Segundo, up and down the streets in a grid, and we mapped all the signals throughout El Segundo. And then we came back later, a few weeks later, and tried to determine where our position was just using our map of the signals. We were able to get it within about 10 or 15 meters, which isn't as accurate as GPS, but if you don't have GPS because your adversary has taken out all the GPS satellites or it's being jammed, this is one way to figure out where you are in, in a rough order of magnitude from where GPS would tell you where. And this is very, very difficult to jam or to spoof because you're looking at single signals over an entire broad spectrum. So it's very hard to jam an entire spectrum. It's like I can't, can't go through today without talking about solar gravity lens. This is a KISS-related innovation that uh, Aerospace and JPL are partnered on. And the idea behind solar gravity lens is the sun will, at the gravitation from the sun will actually form a lens from distant far away light, just the gravity that will focus that light many, many orders of magnitude very far away from the Earth, 550 AU. So solar gravity lens is a concept for a new mission sending small sats out 550 AU from the Earth, which is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, farther than we've gone with any mission before, including Voyager, using solar sails and electric propulsion to get out there. It's a 30-year mission. There's a lot, of, a lot of technology we have to develop in order to do this, a lot of AI to figure out how to control these autonomously. But if we can do that, we could actually image planets around other stars at megapixel resolution, which would just be an incredible feat for science. A little more on the uh, animation here. Another concept is called Mars Drop. Now, this is based on our reentry breakup recorder that we developed. It's a small satellite for accessing hostile terrain on Mars. The missions that we currently have at Mars are, are typically, the landed missions, are typically rovers that either land with a sky crane or airbags, or we have soft landers that use rockets and some combination of parachutes. The problem with all those missions, though, are they have to land in a flat area on Mars, and the geologists don't really care about the flat areas. They want to be up on the mountains. They want to be where the rocks are. So this is a mission that could, for two orders of magnitude less cost, actually access the hostile terrain using an aeroshell. It's a, it's a har harder landing. It uses parachutes. And while it's coming through, it actually deploys a parawing that can take aerial imagery over the area. So we're working with JPL to try and get this to piggyback on one of their missions that's either going to Mars or using Mars as a, as a flyby for, to get out to another planet. Now, not all the innovation that we do are, are widgets and things you can touch. We also have some process innovation as well. Um, launch U is one of our innovations, and this is something that's been picked up by, by every launch vehicle provider. It's a standard for small sats. So we have standards for these, for these cube sats. Uh, there's, there's a device called a P-Pod that attaches to a launch vehicle, and it just shoots these little small sats out one at a time using springs. And there's also standards for larger sats. You get up to a, a satellite that's about the size of this podium right here, and now that's called an ESPA-class satellite. So there's an ESPA ring where you can attach three or six of these satellites around a ring. It's a standard because it attaches to launch vehicles in a standard way, just like the P-Pod does, standard mass, power interfaces, et cetera. But in between the 
podium size and the CubeSat size, there's no standard. And there's a lot of concepts for missions that have satellites that are you know, about a, a foot on each side or maybe 18 inches on each side. There's a lot of capability that you can have there. The problem is there are always secondary payloads on these launch vehicles. So you have to work years in advance and you're, you're always going to be the secondary. If anything happens with the primary payload, they're delayed, you're delayed. What we would like to do is be able to launch on, once you have your satellite done, it's tested, it's ready to go, it meets the launch you standard, you get to go on the next launch vehicle. We call it ship and shoot. So you're done, you go. Here's a short video that describes this. They can be as small as a soda can to the size of a small bus. So once you build it, how are you going to get into orbit? On a rocket, of course, but launching one satellite per rocket gets expensive. So a lot of satellite builders will put their satellites and their money together on a rocket as a rideshare deal. That worked for a while, but now lots of satellite builders need a ride to space. How do you know if your small to medium sized satellite will fit on top of a rocket with a bunch of other satellites? There are only a few standards now, but what if we measured small satellites in launch units? A launch unit is a standard small sat size that we can put into a whole host of different launch vehicles. Think of it like packing cargo into an ocean-going ship. Standardize the container for the ship and you can carry more. Right now, if they're filling up the entire fairing size, they can have that launch all of themselves. They've got extra space, maybe we can stick a couple of launch units in there too. With the launch unit standard, we'll be able to maximize the efficiency of the launch vehicle fairing and fill it up with more satellites and thereby increase access to space for everybody. And as I mentioned, this is uh, it's a draft standard we released at the SmallSat conference last year. We have all the different launch vehicle providers signed up to this. It's, it's a win-win for, for them because they get to fill up their extra space and um, for the satellite providers because they get a faster ride to space. So this, this innovation, this is really interesting. It's a 3D printed hybrid rocket engine that combines the performance and the efficiency and the variable thrust of a liquid engine without all the machinery that you get with that and the simplicity of a solid rocket engine. This is something that we tested last year. What we're doing today is making the first flight of a new, simple, liquid rocket motor. Hopefully one that would be similar in performance to what we normally think of as a liquid rocket motor with turbo pumps and all of that kind of thing. It offers the promise of sort of the best aspects of both a liquid and a solid motor together in one. We are leading the way in printed rocket power. This is an area that was created in aerospace. It's always a heart and throat kind of moment. Go! You hope it goes well. You sort of talk yourself into, and if it doesn't go well, oh well, we can try again. Oh! There are homes here at Aerospace that we can upscale this project and then turn it into a useful uh, launch gear at some point. We should be able to uh, increase the size of the airframe and be able to at least double the performance that we've had. So it's not actually hopes anymore. They have the new one that's going to be launching in July. The new one is, that one was about four feet high. The new one is 13 feet high and about 10 inches in diameter. And so we're, we're scaling this up. It's really interesting use of 3D printing and the different shapes you can do to be able to print the fuel for the engine. And that, that particular video that you saw of it going up, they, they basically just duct taped a GoPro on the outside of the rocket. <laughs> but the new one's going to be a, a little bit more integrated into the rocket. Anyway, I just wanted to give some summary thoughts. Um, it's a really exciting time to be in the aerospace industry. You'll notice that several of the things that I mentioned today are things that happened in the last month, and every month is like that. There's, there's new things happening with these startups, at aerospace, with the rest of the space industry. Um, we're trying to instill a culture of innovation at aerospace, trying to up our game in innovation. 
It's not something that happens overnight, but we're two years into it and got a lot more work to do there. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for coming. <laughs>